Yeah, good morning, everybody. Welcome also from, from my side. My name is Simon Tötli. I'm the other co-chair of the 2019 Space Challenge, and it's my pleasure now to announce the second talk of this morning. As Morgan mentioned before, we, uh, the program for this second part will be, will be mixed. We'll have Tom Nordheim speak first and then um, Morgan Cable again. And at the end, there will be plenty of time for questions from the participant side. Also, one thing I would like to mention is these lectures are recorded. However, the questions and answers will not be recorded. So don't be shy to ask questions. And please ask as many as you can and as you probably have. All right. So for the second lecture, it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Nordheim. He uh, started out with a Bachelor in Science in uh, Space Science and Robotics from the University of Wales. And after that, he got a Master's in Space Studies from the, from the International Space University and then a PhD in Space Physics from University College in London. After that, he came here to the US and he was a NASA postdoctoral fellow at JPL. And now he's there a research scientist in uh, the planetary chemistry and astrobiology section. And his research is extremely relevant for this year's space challenge um, because he works on the chemistry and habitability of icy worlds with a particular emphasis on Saturn's moon Enceladus and Jupiter's moon Europa. And um, today he'll talk about some of the robotic explorers for icy worlds, which uh, the participants will have to think about also for their proposals. So thank you very much, Tom, for joining us. And please help me welcome Tom Nordheim. Thank you. So after that excellent introduction to Enceladus by Morgan, I want to talk a little bit about the type of robots that we might want to design to explore these ocean worlds like Enceladus and Europa you know, at some point further down the line. Now, uh, I know Morgan already went over uh, the ocean worlds, but I wanted to just sort of dwell over this uh, little family portrait of icy worlds. So that's icy bodies in the outer solar system. And of course, we know that these five bodies, two satellites of Saturn, three satellites of Jupiter have confirmed, are confirmed as ocean worlds. However, this might be somewhat of a sampling bias as we've never really gone and looked specifically for ocean worlds. Uh, really, in both these cases, the discovery of the oceans was, was sort of serendipitous. And so all these bodies, or let's say some, of, some fraction of these bodies, probably had an ocean at some point during its life. And some of them might still have oceans at present day. So I would just want to urge you a little bit to think about the potential for ocean worlds, not just your open Enceladus, but also the potential for maybe a host of these ocean worlds in the outer solar system. Now, of course, perhaps the most famous ocean world is Europa. And we know Europa as this, you know, crazy looking young surface marred with these cracks and this brownish red material. Now, the nature of this non-water ice, so we, we know that the surfaces of these icy worlds is mainly made of water ice, but <laughs> the nature of this non-water ice component is still under debate. Something happened here. Well, um, and there's been a big discussion whether or not this material is produced by a radiolytic uh, interactions between energetic plasma hitting the surface ice and breaking up uh, chemical bonds, depositing sulfur, creating hydrated sulfuric acid, or if it's some sort of salt coming up from the ocean. Now, however, however I would say if you look at the highest resolution close-up images we have of the surface, we see that this brownish red material seems to correlate somewhat with uh, portions of the surface that, are high, uh, surface that are highly disrupted, where we expect that it's possible that some ocean material might make it up to the surface. Now, this is very exciting to us because it gives us potentially an opportunity to sample material from the ocean without having to drill through, uh, through that several kilometer, maybe tens of kilometer thick ice shell. And in fact, as Morgan mentioned, there is a potential mission currently under study at uh, JPL to do just this. And this is an artist's representation of uh, the mission concept, which would be to go to the surface and go and dig into this potential ocean material to use that to study the composition of the ocean and potentially also look for signatures of life. 
Now, of course, we're not here to study Europa this week. We're here to talk about Enceladus. Uh, Morgan already gave an excellent introduction. Uh, we already know uh, quite a bit about the ocean uh, from sampling the gas and the dust on the plume. So we have the, um, the composition, the major constituents of the plume gas. And as Morgan also mentioned, uh, we also have some very interesting minor species, including uh, simple and complex organics. Um, and as Morgan also mentioned, we have H2 at the relatively large concentrations, which is exciting as a potential energy source for life. Um, we have also sampled the ice grains that are emanating from the plume. And this is an example of a spectrum uh, from one of these ice grains. And this is really showing that the, the ocean is salty, probably, probably containing sodium chloride salt, like the Earth's oceans. And so this little cartoon is just showing how these salty grains make it up through the, the plume vents. Um, also, uh, we've, as Morgan also mentioned, uh, we've also found this high mass organic cations. So these are ice grains that contain large organic molecules of maybe uh, larger masses than 200 Daltons. Uh, now, what's really interesting that I want to emphasize here is that the hypothesis for how these forms is through a organic rich film that's located at the top of the ocean, indicated here. Now, this is really interesting because it means that there might be actually be an enhanced concentration of organic organics right underneath Enceladus's ice shell. Um, we've also detected these dust particles uh, called stream particles that contain high temperature, uh, that contain um, SiO2. So that indicates that uh, the environment that they were created in is uh, something akin to a high temperature hydrothermal uh, vent system, uh, likely occurring on the ocean floor of Enceladus. It also indicates that the ocean may be alkaline. Now, so that leaves us with the sort of picture where we have, you know, we have the water rock reactions, hydrothermal vents, um, similar conditions to how we thought life might have formed, how we think life might have formed in the early Earth. Uh, we have a transport of this materials up to the ice shells, uh, ice shell, and we have an enhanced concentration of organics in this film right underneath the ice shell. And of course, this is coming out through the surface jets. And so if you look, if you go to the Earth, you actually find that these under ice environments, uh, because of the, the availability of solar photons and, or, and nutrients, you actually tend to find a concentration of life right on that uh, ice water interface, right underneath the ice. Uh, this is an example of ice algae. So this shows you a little cross section where you see that these brownish material, that's ice algae that's concentrated right in that ocean water um, interface. Um, this is from Antarctica. Uh, this is from the Arctic Ocean, again showing this concentration of these life forms underneath the ice. Um, this is actually uh, the runoff of a sulfur spring on uh, Heiberg Island in the Canadian High Arctic, um, Axel Heiberg Island. And uh, this actually is home to, it's a little bit hard to see here, but the sulfur oxidizing uh, bacteria. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, this is the underside of the Ross ice shelf in Antarctica. And this actually are, these are little uh, sea anemones. Oh, uh, I hope I said that correctly. Anemones, anemones okay. yes. <laughs> yeah, sea anemones. Um, and so, Really, you know, this is showing that uh, as we investigate these environments on Earth, we're really finding that they're teeming with life, and they especially love these inter this interface. Um, now, going back to the icy worlds, um, of course, the ice shell uh, on Enceladus is far too thick to really have solar photons. Uh, transported to it. But what does happen is that we have radiation from Saturn's magnetosphere uh, is uh, basically breaking up chemical bonds in the surface ice and producing oxidants. Those oxidants are transported through the ice into the ocean. And what we think 
the hypothesis for how life could exist on these ocean worlds is that they could be using chemical energy rather than photosynthesis for life. Now, um, the uh, important part about that is you need to have sort of two poles of the chemical battery. So you get one of them at the ocean floor, but these oxidants supplied from the surface could really be what's powering this uh, oceanic life on Enceladus, hypothetical. And so if you were to go look for life, would you, similarly to what you see at the Earth, have a concentration of life at this interface? Now, so based on that, we were thinking, well, could we build a rover uh, that could actually explore this interface? Now, if you made a buoyant rover, you could actually drive upside down. <laughs> and that is exactly what we did. So these are some early prototypes uh, that are just basically uh, 3D printed tubes with 3D printed wheels. We have a couple of cameras here, and we have these foam field, uh, filled wheels for, for buoyancy. And uh, here you see we have little traction spikes for the ice and a little flexible uh, steel spring tail that pops out when we deploy it through a borehole. And of course, that was really the first attempt and then we developed on that and we built some more capable vehicles, uh, different shapes and sizes. Um, now, while we have these vehicles, we needed to find an environment where we could test them. Uh, ideally, something that was as comparable to an icy ocean world as possible. And so we picked this spot up here, uh, Barrow, Alaska, which is the northernmost point in the US. Um, and in fact, it's the northernmost town. There are actually no roads leading up there. Uh, it's the central city of the North Slope Borough, which, uh, which has a few thousand people living in it. Um, it is an extreme environment, but, but life still thrives there. And uh, it's really very good for us because it's an accessible window to both sea and lake ice. So it's right there on the shore. In the uh, spring, we can go out on the frozen sea ice uh, and in the fall, when the sea ice is not frozen yet, we can go out on the frozen lakes. Uh, what's also interesting uh, is that these Arctic environments are seeing the effects of climate change in a much more pronounced way than um, what we're seeing at uh, lower latitudes. And so that actually also gives us an opportunity to study the effects of climate change on these fragile, uh, icy environments. Um, this is a picture uh, from Barrow in the summertime. Uh, so the permafrost terrain uh, provides basins for swamps and marshes. Um, uh, the ice, the permafrost ice, persists for at least several tens of centimeters underground. Um, and so you have this short window here where you have, I wouldn't call it summer, but at least it's not icy. Um, in the wintertime, uh, the lake ice grows, uh, leaving exposed holes at methane seeps. So these are methane clathrates that are being released uh, from the, the bottom of these lakes. And in fact, studying these uh, methane releases is actually very relevant to uh, environmental science and climate change, because uh, we believe that as the temperatures increase, more of these uh, methane clathrates thaw and more of, more of the methane is released, uh, which is a potent climate gas. So that's an important thing to study. Um, uh, in the winter, the ice grows uh, nearly freezing through entirely to the bottom of the lake. And in the spring, the cycle starts again, the ice melting, floating upwards, and then it's pushed uh, downwind. And uh, I like to show this, uh, this map of Barrow. So uh, really, we have access to the sea ice out here. And actually, if you look at this map, I mean, these are all uh, inland lakes. And so really, we have a vast environment to explore with our robots. Um, the other thing that's great about Barrow is that even though it is very remote and quite re extreme, you can actually take a regular passenger flight up there. You can take an Alaska Airlines flight from Anchorage. Um, here's a robot being um, probably quite roughly unloaded from the airplane. <laughs> In fact, uh, this is probably one of the more harsh conditions that we have to design for is the transport. <laughs> Um, and then uh, once we're all set up, we, we take the robot and our equipment out on snow machines and we drive out to the lakes. Now, uh, this is an example of one of the camps we set out, out on one of the frozen lakes, uh, about 30 miles south of the, the town. 
and uh, we like to call it Nassaville. <laughs> now, uh, sometimes Nassaville is quite quiet and beautiful like this. Other times, <laughs> so you really have to be prepared for everything when you go out there. Uh, the weather can change quite quickly. Um, of course, when things have died down a little bit, uh, we're ready to deploy the rover. Uh, this is an earlier version of the rover that has an a onboard spool and a tether. Um, here we're ready to deploy. Uh, we've cut a big hole in the ice. Uh, quite cold already, as you can see. Um, and so... So that's all well and good. We deploy the rover. Um, however, we found some flaws with our initial designs. Uh, one of them was that having these razor sharp wheels that cut into the ice is a bit of a problem when you have the spool. <laughs> Not only do you get tangled in the spool quite easily, but you also have a tendency to cut it. Uh, the other issue is that you know, this, this ice is mostly covered by snow, so you can't really see through it. And, and so one of the problems we had was localizing our rover. It can be quite hard to map when you're looking at the camera images uh, and then trying to map where the rover actually is and trying to retrieve it afterwards. So here we actually had to sweep off the snow to kind of follow the rover along so we always knew where it was. Now, uh, so we wanted to try and think of some upgrades that would improve on some of these issues. Uh, so this is the most recent version of the rover, the Buoyant Rover for Under Ice Exploration, or BUI. Um, it has a modular instrument base, and really we're envisioning this as a platform where scientists can come to us with their instruments and we can accommodate them um, and give them an opportunity to test instruments, potentially for ocean world exploration, uh, in relevant environments on Earth. Um, we have, of course, these wheels that are optimized for both a, a hard surface with these spikes and also a soft surface, uh, as you can see here. Uh, we have powerful LEDs. So we have directed illumination that we can use to explore things, uh, both on the lake floor or sea floor and underneath the ice. Uh, one quite neat feature is that these pods can rotate independently of each other. So each pod has its instrument base a camera and a powerful light source, and you can actually rotate these independently to uh, investigate different things. Um, now we have onboard localization and data processing, and uh, we'll also we also want to try and improve on this by adding um, some level of autonomy to the system. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Now one one other really big improvement is that we added an acoustic navigation and communication system. So that allows us to drop the tether, and it also allows us with an opportunity to roughly pinpoint where the rover is at any given time. <coughs> so the rover uh, brewery, as it currently is designed, uh, is built for lake and ocean ice exploration, uh, deep ice shelf deployments, and glacial hydrological mapping. So we designed it with an endurance of a long, relatively long endurance of roughly a week. Uh, we can traverse more than a kilometer. Uh, we can go from anything from shallow depths of a meter or half a meter to 1,500 meters. And the whole system is built to be deployed through a 25 centimeter diameter bore, ice borehole. Uh, as I said, we have the modular instrument base, we have the dual camera, uh, and we can either use the high bandwidth tether or the low bandwidth acoustic communications. Uh, we also have some built-in obstacle detection and avoidance uh, based on the cameras. 
and uh, we have a built-in system for georeferencing location and waypoint tracking. <coughs> now, uh, as I alluded to earlier, one of our most important design criteria is that we're compatible with the maximum dimensions and weight of airline checked luggage. <laughs> That's another important feature. And we also have the opportunity in the system to do remote satellite or local uh, commands and control of the rover. <coughs> uh, we've done uh, a number of deployments, um, uh, increasingly complex deployments, um, and our current instrument is the context cameras, pH, dissolved oxygen, luminosity, uh, electrical connectivity, temperature, pressure, uh, and also uh, the solved methane. Uh, we also, at some point in the future, would like to have some uh, capability for sample collection. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, now, one of the improvements that I spoke of is the ability to remotely operate. And so we produced uh, these cellular ground stations. So the idea is we take brewery out on the ice, we drill a hole, deploy it, and we have these ground stations set up around the frozen lake. Um, each ground station has a cellular modem, it has a satellite modem, and it has an acoustic transducer that can use to talk to the rover. So it means that not only can we talk to the rover th remotely, but we can also use the ranging from the distant ground stations to ping the rover and get a rough sense of where it is located. And uh, here are some very happy members of our team that are now able to control the rover from inside one of these nice and warm huts and not the cold, cold ice that you saw earlier. And so we actually had a test where we used the cellular network to remotely operate the rover in the uh, frozen lake uh, from JPL. <coughs> and so I talked about this already. We get the the onboard location estimator gives a position update every uh, five, uh, well, five, uh, five times a second. <coughs> um, here uh, is the new version of the rover uh, underneath the sea ice on the sea ice deployment. And in fact, uh, you can see here um, that you have this brownish uh, ice algae material actually uh, visible underneath the sea ice. And if you zoom in, um, can see it even more clearly. You see this little ice growth filled with these, uh, this brownish material, this, these ice algae. <coughs> and you can actually also uh, see quite well that the amount of lights that's, uh, light that's transported through even a couple of meters of ice is quite significant. And hence why these, uh, these biological communities can survive there. <coughs> um, now, uh, one of our most recent tests, uh, we really wanted to step up our game in terms of um, uh, both duration and traverse length. And so uh, in fall 2017, uh, we actually uh, traversed uh, almost 1.8 kilometers. We had a demonstrated endurance of 82 hours, but that was actually mainly limited by the fact that the team had to go home. Uh, we actually think that we could have uh, operated for about 55 kilometers, um, which is a pretty significant range. And this is actually on, another thing um, might be worth mentioning is, another issue, another constraint related to having to take brewery on commercial airlines is actually the power source. Now, as you know, there's been some issues with taking large lithium batteries on planes recently. Um, so we are actually just using uh, commercial C cell batteries that you can buy in the store. Uh, not the most efficient power source, but it really saves us a world of trouble. So you can imagine we could easily swap out that power source with a higher energy density uh, in the future if we so wish. Um, in the future, uh, we'd like to uh, develop even longer, even capability for longer duration under ice operations, maybe as much as three to four months. Uh, we want to test the remote operations via satellite. Um, we also want to be able to have the rover do waypoint navigation and also uh, map methane seeps and do some level of autonomous science. Um, so that's quite useful for us because it really lowers the amount of time that we have to spend commanding the rover. So we can have it do this waypoint navigation, then we can just give it a path and check in on it every once in a while. Um, another thing that we also 
we're also looking into is having deployable wheels. So the motivation for that is that if you can fold the wheels in, you'd be able to deploy it through a much smaller borehole. borehole. And this actually is um, a, a prototype of this, just really made to test for the deployable wheels. And here you see it sort of sticking down through the ice, having unfolded its wheels. And here you see an example of it actually driving around with these uh, claw-like unfoldable wheels. <coughs> Uh, and so really what we're envisioning for summer, like, uh, for exploration of ocean worlds like Europa here, but also Enceladus, is that you know, we really have a sequence of, of missions. Um, in the case of Europa, we have Europa Clipper, which is a selected mission that will uh, go to the Jupiter system and, and, and really investigate Europa's ice shell and habitability. We have proposed missions such as Europa Lander, we have possible things like hexapod robot, uh, ice melt probe that goes through the ice. Uh, and so we imagine that an architecture like Brewery, this under ice rover, might fit into this uh, kind of sort of future architecture of ocean world exploration and, uh, and uh, the search for, for life. <coughs> and I just want to end with a little video here uh, showing talking a little bit about Brewery and showing some more footage of it in action. <coughs> the rover that our team has built is an early, early, early precursor of something that we may someday fly to Europa. The buoyant rover for under ice exploration is designed to float on the underside of the ice and throw as if the other side of the ice is the ground. These ecosystems up in Alaska, these lakes that, that freeze over uh, every year and then freeze down, they're just one example of life in an extreme environment that can help guide us in assessing whether or not a world like Europa could harbor life. I'm actually not in this one. We cut a hole in the ice, put the rover underneath the ice, and then we left it out there to rove around. And we went back to the nice warm quantum hut, and our team was even able to hand over control to engineers down in JPL. And so we think this truly was the first time ever that an underwater, under ice, untethered vehicle has been operated through satellite link. Our work has this wonderful marriage of advancing our understanding of what's happening on our own planet while simultaneously feeding forward into our exploration of potentially habitable worlds beyond it. So now I believe we'll have Morgan talking a little bit about instrumentation uh, for life detection on ocean worlds. Tom gave you a taste of where we might be a decade or two from now. Uh, but in the meantime, you guys need to design something that can work sort of with technology that we have that can fit under a New Frontiers cost cap. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a taste of different flavors of instruments. I'm not going to go in too much detail into any one kind, but during the Q&A session, we can talk about a lot of different options. Uh, so I typically classify instruments in two categories, remote sensing versus in situ. You know, basically, whether you want to touch stuff or not. And for remote sensing, there are a lot of different options. You can include everything from imagers to spectrometers, uh, this is an example from the thermal infrared instrument aboard Cassini showing heat maps. Uh, typically, these instruments are things that you can do from orbit or from flybys, uh, things like that. Uh, they can be great in terms of getting sort of overall ideas of um, what's going on on the surface. You can get c comprehensive images to put things in context. 
but they tend to be a little bit limited in terms of, say, uh, spatial resolution or things like that. So there is a give and a take. When it comes to in situ instruments, there are tons of options. Uh, this is an example of an image that was taken by, uh, I think, the Rosetta mission uh, to a comet to look at some dust. You can get context imagery, which can be really important. Um, and then in situ, I include things like mass spectrometers, where you're basically sticking out your tongue and tasting what's there, or collecting a sample and ingesting it in. Now, in situ data, especially if you're landing, if you're trying to get down into the subsurface ocean, like some of the architectures that Tom described, this can get much more costly, right? And so your science return has to be commensurate, typically, with the cost of that type of architecture. So that's something to think about. It doesn't mean that it's impossible, but you really have to be, um, be careful about not making your mission turn into a Christmas tree, not bringing everything, but only including the right instruments to do the right science. And so everything has to start with the science. Now, for Enceladus, I turned it upside down. Don't freak out. There's really no up in space, so it's fine. Um, and there are actually a few different in situ environments that you can think of here, right? The plume technically is in situ. So you don't necessarily need to land to be able to sample the ocean directly. Now, you need to think about what is happening. As Tom mentioned, there could be some different processes that are either enriching or maybe depleting. We're not sure. Um, organics or other types of things that are in that material, as it's squeezed or forced up through these vents, you really have to think about the provenance, right? How that sample might be changing to where it may or may not be really representative of what's in the ocean. But if you can do that, you could just sample the plume and say, okay, we've got what we need for the ocean. You could also land, right? That's another in situ option, and do what Europa Lander, that concept, would propose to do. So just land, grab some stuff from the surface. In the case of Enceladus, if you landed near the South Pole, you could even have snow coming down on you and collect a really fresh sample, right? You could probably collect more with that architecture than you could just doing flybys, but that depends on how many flybys you do and how big your collector is. There are a lot of knobs you can tweak. And then, of course, the environment that Tom talked about, trying to get down to that ocean itself. Obviously, that would be, if, if I was just a scientist and money was no option, I had some, some really famous multi-billionaire be like, here, take my money, go do something cool. That's where I would want to go, right? But some of the technology to access the subsurface ocean is still under development. And so that's something that you may need to consider. Technology readiness level, TRL, did you guys talk about that yesterday at JPL? You know what that is? That's um, something important to consider as well. So there are a lot of different in situ environments that you could explore. Now, when, when you think about instruments, uh, typically there are a couple of different kind of boxes you put stuff into. There's the instrument itself, obviously, whether it's a mass spectrometer, the, the, the meat of a, a, an imaging system, right? If you want to do spectroscopy, what kind of diffraction grading do you have? If you want to do mass spec, you know, what kind of, is it a time of flight? Is it a multi-bounce? Is it, you know, a, a quadrupole? There are all sorts of different things there. The front end also matters. Are you going to have a sampling system? If you're flying through a plume, do you have some sort of collector that you need to keep clean? Do you have a concentrator? Do you need to do any processing to your sample before it gets into your instrument? We usually call that the front end. And you got to think about that. What if, let's say, you want to detect life? Ideally, it'd be great to apply your battery of life detection techniques to the same sample. So does that mean you collect a whole bunch of one thing and then divvy it up between the different instruments? Are some of the instruments non-destructive? So then you can look at it with one instrument and then pop it into your mass spectrometer, which heats it up and destroys the sample, but then you get more data. So you still have multiple techniques uh, detecting, sort of studying the same sample that you've collected, or is that not possible? Do you need to collect a bunch of different samples from the same environment and send them separately to different instruments? And how does that tie into your science story? And then the output of the instrument. Have you done calibration? Um, are your instruments co-bore sided so you're looking at the same place? Or do you need to take into account differences in pointing or, or sample handling or other things? Um, and getting that data back to Earth so you can actually look at it. So there are a few things that I think it would be important for you guys to think about when selecting your payload. Remember, you're not just selecting one instrument. You need to start with a science question. It has to start with the science. So come up with the science questions you want to answer. 
and then figure out what is the perfect payload that can answer all those questions to the best of your ability, just those questions. It would be great to bring everything, but trust me, you can't afford to bring everything. The most soul-crushing part of designing a mission is you'd be like, I want to do all the science and I'm going to bring all the things, and then you start to do your study and they're like, that's way too expensive, C cut it down a bit. So you'd be like, okay, we'll throw off this one in instrument because we've still got these five more, that'll be okay. And then they'll come back and they'll say, no, it's still too expensive. You throw off another one. And you know, it's, it's an iterative process, but if you start off with very specific science questions, you can kind of cut down the, the soul-wrenching part of cutting out instruments because you've already started with something that's conservative but focused. So let's go through these. So performance. Think about the types of instruments that you want to take. Are they sensitive enough to make the measurements that you want? Um, are you able to meet your science goals with margin? This is important. You can't just barely meet. Let's say you want to detect, um, I don't know, a certain concentration of salts on the surface of Enceladus that'll tie back to habitability. And your instrument is sensitive to parts per thousand carbonate. But, oh, you really want it down to parts per million. How do you do that? Can you prove that that instrument is the right one or do you need to find something more sensitive? Um, is your instrument overkill? Can something simpler do the job? Make sure that you've got a calibration story that makes sense. And I can email these slides to you guys. You don't have to worry about taking pictures. Uh, what about accommodation on the spacecraft? There are some instruments I would love to take, but they're just too big or too heavy. And so you may have to compromise on things like sensitivity or resolution in order to just have it be able to fit on whatever spacecraft bus you're planning on bringing with you, especially if you want to land. Then things get really expensive. So smaller, lighter can be better, but you still have to make sure that it fits into your science requirements. Uh, what about pointing requirements? Let's say you want to have an imaging spectrometer, and so you're, you're going to be looking over a certain spectral range, and you're going to have really great spatial resolution too, but oh, your spacecraft butt has too much jitter, and so every single instrument that you have pointing at the surface is going to get a blurry image because you can't keep things still because you're going too fast, and, and your pointing mirrors just can't handle that. There are things like that to think about. Uh, like I said before, it'd be really cool if you had multiple instruments analyzing the same thing. That could be looking at the same place on the surface. You saw those beautiful images I showed of Enceladus where we had the heat map laid on top, laid on top of that beautiful, just visible image. That was because we had things that were either co boresighted or we did some really creative data overlaying later. So thinking about what instruments you can use at the same time is a lot better to collect a comprehensive picture of what's happening on that moon right now. Because like we said, some of the vents of Enceladus, some of those jets are turning on and off. So you want to make sure that if you're collecting a data set that it's as comprehensive as it can be. Planetary protection, have you guys talked about this yet? This gets really fun, especially if you're thinking about a lander. Now for orbiters and flybys, it's less of a problem. Your spacecraft disposal, you just have to have a plan for that. Don't crash on Enceladus. Crash somewhere else, please. <laughs> uh, Cassini actually dove into Saturn on purpose because it was a victim of its own success. Since Cassini discovered liquid water on Enceladus and Titan, and potentially Mimas as well, we knew that we couldn't just let that spacecraft drift around because uh, when Cassini was built, it was cleaned, but it wasn't sterilized. It was a uh, bio uh, contamination level two. And so that just meant clean it, like make sure you know, there's not any skin cells or anything obvious, but they didn't sterilize it because they didn't think they needed to. Back in 97, we thought the Saturn system was just ice and dead and this would be fine. Since we found liquid water, we had to come up with a better disposal plan. And we decided since the environment of Saturn is not conducive to life as we know it, that that was a safe place to dispose of Cassini. Other mission architectures may dispose on other moons, but the point is you don't want to just let your spacecraft run out of power, run out of fuel, no longer be able to contact it, and just have it drift around in the Saturn system forever, because it could accidentally crash on Enceladus. The probability is low, but it still could happen a thousand years from now, 10,000 years from now, and then you could potentially contaminate that ocean with Earth life. And that, what would be worse than finally finding life somewhere else and then realizing we put it there with a previous spacecraft? So planetary protection is really important. If you plan on touching the surface, if you plan on staying on the surface, you need to have some kind of plan for that. There's also something called contamination control. So let's say you design something to do flybys, but the plume density isn't huge. So you've got a big collector to collect as many grains as possible. That's great. 
But what if your spacecraft is outgassing something? Maybe you, you've got these jets, right? These little jets to help adjust your orientation as you're flying through places, and, and those are spewing out hydrazine. Oh, gee, that's an organic molecule. And what if that gets all over your collector? Or what if some of that outgassing material condenses on one of the mirrors of your, of your spectrometer? That can be a problem. So thinking about how you're contaminating yourself with your own spacecraft is important, too. Data sufficiency is something that we talk about a lot. So you have your science questions. You have your instruments to answer your science questions. You have to prove that the data your instruments collect is going to be enough to answer those science questions. So not just how much, but the, the right amounts of data, the right types of data. For some of these instruments, imaging spectrometers, these are great. They're awesome, but they are the biggest data hogs ever. It's essentially you, you take a picture, but for every pixel in that image, that's actually spectrum. So you can envision for each image is actually what we call a data cube, which is great, right? You can, you can zoom in on an image and you can get composition of organics, of salts, things like this. The mapping imaging spectrometer for Europa, MISE, that's going to be on the Europa Clipper mission is an example of this. But that also means that you have a lot of data. And how do you transmit that back to Earth, especially the Saturn system? Very far away, right? So think about things for onboard data compression. Just have a story there that makes sense if you're going to include a data-hungry instrument. Uh, TRL, technology readiness level, this is going to be critical. Tom showed a lot of very cool instrument concepts and, and delivery concepts for something that could reach an Enceladus ocean or a Europa ocean. That's great, but if I were to take Brewy and plop that onto a spacecraft right now, I couldn't get, guarantee that it would work the way that some more mature instruments would, just because it's still in the development pipeline, right? Um, and that's fine. Depending on when you plan on launching, you could say, by the time we plan on being on the rocket and going to Saturn, we're going to include something like Brewy because we can prove that at that point, five, ten years from now, whenever you plan on launching, the technology will be mature enough. You just have to have a story that's clean, that makes sense. Uh, and then, of course, the thing that we hate to talk about but usually ends up driving everything, cost. Making sure that not only can you fit within your cost cap, but you can do so with margin. Uh, as many of our mission development stories tell us, especially when you're including new technology or instruments that we haven't designed and built before, cost growth can be a factor, and it's something to consider. So NASA tends to prefer missions that have really thoroughly thought about their cost story and have a clear plan with plenty of margin, not just cost margin, but schedule margin, because that ends up turning into dollars too. So think really carefully. If you're right up, let's say your cost cap is a billion dollars and you're 999 million, 999,000, that's bad, right? You really want to show that you can fit under that cost cap and that your design is mature enough that you can handle any potential slips of schedule or growth or things like that along the way. Uh, so I know I've given you a lot to think about, but just keep in mind that this is supposed to be fun, right? I mean, we're, you're going to a place that no one's ever been before. And you can include a lot of great things. A billion dollars is not a lot, but you can still do a lot of cool science. Uh, these are just a few examples of things that have flown before that you may want to consider in your repertoire or your, your uh, list to down select from. Imagers are great. Spectrometers are great. Some things sort of fit under both of them. This is a, the mapping imaging spectrometer I was telling you about for Europa, where it takes an image. But then you get a spectrum like this for every single point in the image. And there you can have thermal imagers too. They do the same thing just in the infrared and that can get you heat maps so you can figure out surface temperature. Might be important if you want to make sure that, I don't know, a vent is currently outgassing like right now. So that can be really helpful. Uh, the UV spectrum, this is UVIS, which flew aboard Cassini. That can uh, give you all sorts of compositional information, which can be really useful. So imagers, and plus for the public, having some of those beautiful images of Enceladus in the plume really helps um, get public support for the science that you're doing. I would strongly recommend against ever flying a mission without a camera. It's a bad idea. Some kind of camera is good. Uh, you can also do all sorts of other things with remote sensing. Uh, Cassini radar, gravity, plasma instruments can tell you about the radiation environment. 
Uh, magnetospheric measurements can give you, that's actually how we were able to determine that a lot of these ocean worlds have oceans, is through our magnetometers. So those are really critical pieces of instrumentation as well. Uh, so these are just a couple of the remote sensing type things that you could do. Now, when it comes to in situ, I count mass spectrometers as in situ, even if you're not landing because you're still ingesting something, right? Whether it's gas molecules or grains from the Enceladus plume. You've got a lot of options here. Mass spectrometers are great. Those can tell you exactly what molecules are there, depending on your resolution, right? Cassini's INMS could not tell the difference between CO and N2. Any mass spectrometer that we would fly today could absolutely do that. Some of these uh, mass specs, this is an example, it's the, what is it, the mass spectrometer for planetary exploration or something like that. Um, this one is uh, going to be aboard the Europa Clipper mission, and that has a resolving power that's really good. I think it's like 50,000. It's very, um, it's not just good for small molecules, but can also tell the difference between um, isotopes, which could be important if you wanted to do isotopic ratios to identify if gases were modified by life or not. Um, that type of instrument can help you there. This is an example of a uh, current dust detector, SUDA, the surface dust analyzer, I think. It's going to be a board clipper. So this is similar to CDA, a board Cassini. This is something that sticks out its tongue and tastes the, the ice and the dust grains that are coming out of the plume. So this can give you composition, just like um, the, the high mass organic cations that we identified, but at better resolution. Now this type of instrument can't get you, this is a protein, but it could tell you there are things at the right masses for proteins. So that could be another uh, thing to, to drop in. Microscopes, if you're, now we're talking about either collecting an ice grain through some sort of really delicate flyby architecture or now landing. Um, then you could get at uh, grain morphology. You could look for some of those structures like Tom was showing you, some of the morphological signatures of life, those, those algae or, or other types of things that were trapped in layers of the ice. And what would be more of a smoking gun than actually imaging a cell, right? That would be amazing if you can do it. Uh, once you're landed, you can also do geophysics measurements. This is an, an image of SICE, the seismometer that's uh, deployed right now on, off of InSights on Mars. Uh, now, geophysics measurements are really important for context, right? Um, trying to understand how Enceladus is flexing over its orbit, how that might influence the dynamics of the plume or any other information we might get from that. You can learn a lot about the structure of the interior of Enceladus that right now we have some guesses for, but this would really help us understand that uh, to much higher fidelity. So there are a lot of instruments out there. This is just a taste. But I want you to keep in mind that everything stems from the science. That's where you have to start. Now, you can go back and tweak your science questions later. But I can tell you, if you start with things that are compelling, but also focused, that'll put you in a much better place um, than saying, we want to do all the things and measure all the things. That's You won't be able to afford to do that for a New Frontiers mission. If you have a directed, focused, compelling science question, that can really help you hone in on your payload. Think about trying to do new things that we haven't done before. Cassini did a ton of science in the Saturn system, but it left a lot of questions. In fact, we have more questions now than we started out with, which is great. That's what you want of a good mission. Think about those questions. Think about which ones are exciting, and maybe it will take us in a new direction. Don't try to answer all the questions or do all the things. Find one thing that you think you can do really well. And dare mighty things, because that's what we do at JPL. And I think that's all I had. So thank you all. Tom and I are going to come up now. We're happy to answer any questions you may have.